glad you're here with me. Uh, so many stories to talk about as uh, we wrap up 2020. We're not wrapped up on this show quite yet. We'll be with you all through next week and a bit into the week after, but there's a lot going on. Um, one of the conversations that has faded a bit, because uh, there's so much else happening, has been the conversations we were having a few months ago about the uh, the need to reform the police. It's going to be a live issue. It hasn't gone anywhere. It's just right now a bit suppressed by everything else happening in the world. I read a really interesting article uh, by uh, Arthur Reiser, who uh, joins us here from time to time. He is a uh, former Department of Justice uh, criminal prosecutor, and he's the director of the Criminal Justice and Civil Liberties Program at the R Street Institute. And he's good enough to join us this morning. Arthur, you were writing about the role of technology in policing, which is obviously great. Like, you know, like we, we want to have our police to be efficient with record keeping and have good communications. So we don't want police using mid 20th century technology. But there is a tension sometimes between how to responsibly use new and emerging technologies. There was a big debate in, in Canada a few years ago about whether our police should be using facial recognition technology so there's that difference right everybody wants them to have you know modern firearms modern radios modern computers do we want cutting edge experimental artificial intelligence well that was a bit more of a debate right and i think one of the things that people forget is that the the, the debate about militarization is really a debate about technology um i mean that we, you look at those old gangster movies and you saw the the G, you know, the, the G man using the six shooter and the the, the the gangster using the Tommy gun, and they, they the, there was this this increased pressure to give better technology to the police. That debate has led us down the technology um, um, lane and into militarization. But you know, obviously, you know, there's a whole other layer of technology that we can be talking about, which is what you brought up: facial recognition. Um, and, and even, you know, things that do geo spotting of where individuals are. And during the protests over the summer, we actually saw that police were using um, that type of technology to try to figure out who individuals were um, uh, during the civil unrest and sometimes um, riots. Uh, and I think we do have to be scary, uh, excuse me, worried about that and thinking about that. Um, you know, it is a very fine line that moves from, uh, useful technology and into you know Gestapo type of, of of tactics, and I think we have to be careful. I also think that the culture aspect of policing is something that we really need to talk about. You know, you've heard me over. You know, you and I have known each other for a couple of years. I've been talking about the research I've been doing um, with policing, and one of the things that came up is I asked about just body cameras. And the thing that shook me was most of the officers said they actually like body cameras. But not for the reasons that I thought would come up. Not a single officer that I interviewed, not one, and I did 351 hours of interviews, said that body cameras ensure that police officers are, are, are calmer, that they act more appropriately. Every single one said it helps cops with prosecutions, that helps cops with uh, bad uh, um, uh, reports of, of uh, misconduct. And I think that right there says something about the police culture. It really is a me versus you uh, uh, world in the policing field. And if they're using technology to further the me versus you, I think that uh, that is dangerous. I had read years ago, and it's something that you're just referring to there, um, that one of the reasons police forces, which had been reluctant at first to roll out body cameras, all of a sudden became enthusiastic adopters of them is because exactly as you just mentioned, it had been helpful when police had been accused of misconduct to be able to go, right. well, let's look at the tape, let's look at the tape. In, in the, on the one hand, that is encouraging, right? I mean, it did, it did suggest and it had some actual proof behind it that a lot of allegations of uh, bad behavior against police officers were, were untrue. They, they were bogus, which was obviously encouraging. But as you said, if that feeds into the technology of the police being something separate and distinct from the public, you might be fixing right. one problem, but you're adding to another one. Exactly. And police are not soldiers. They're of the people for the people. They're supposed to come from the population. For me, it wasn't. I didn't have a problem with this idea that body cameras helped um, you know, in, ensure that bad uh, reports and bad claims were, were, were shot down. It was not a single officer, not one, said, yeah, body cameras will ensure that we, we're, we're on the up and up. 
if we're being watched, we're on the up and up. And I just want people to think about, just go back to the George Floyd incident for one second. I know we've been talking about that ad nauseum, but it's still relevant. I want people to think and just close your eyes and imagine what if cameras were not rolling that day? What if cameras weren't rolling? What have, would have been the impact on the Minneapolis Police Department? What have been, what would have been the impact on those two officers that were in training at the time? What would have been the cultural impact? And what would have been the broader impact as that trickled down to the effect? Alexander King was on his second shift being trained um, uh, that day. And what, what, what happened when he became a trainer in five years from now? What would he have taught his next generation? So you can see how technology has this enormous impact on, on, on police culture. But it's also true that in the reverse is happening. I mean, you're seeing um, people use technology as a, as a weapon system um, against the police. And I, I, you know, I, 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 I understand. I get it. I understand why you would want to use facial recognition against police officers who are covering their faces. You know, that happened in D.C. But I do think you should be eyes wide open about the risk, because if we get into a, a Cold War, um, with police over technology, protesters are probably going to lose. And I think that is something we should be aware of. You know, even just something, I mean, just, just an observation for me on the outside, uh, something that has changed the game is something that a couple, a couple of weeks ago um, there was uh, an arrest not, not far from where I live. And it, it ended up being, uh, my understanding was, you know, some guy was speeding and he mouthed off to the officers so they cuffed him while they sorted things out. Two or three people stopped and videotaped the whole thing, and I don't know if I don't know if why they were doing that. I don't know what happened before I was witness to it, but I think it's very very interesting to see the way this unfolds. Every officer out there has got to understand that they're going to be on camera almost all the time. And a, a few years ago, right. when there had been an incident in my neighborhood. The police went door to door knocking and asking, may we please have your home security footage? And we we didn't have home security cameras, but a bunch of my neighbors did, and I'd never even thought about it before. I mean, these cameras are becoming ubiquitous. I carry an HD camera in my pocket all the time. Not only do I carry an HD camera in my pocket all the time, I can also blast that to the entire free world at the speed of light. Right. Yeah, I mean, I, my car has five cameras on it that are recording all the time, and it keeps three days of, of backup tape. So, I mean, it, it, I mean, heaven forbid um, I ever got into a traffic accident um, or a police officer ever mistreated me, I would have five different angles um, to to show the world. And I think that this is, you know, this is a generational thing. I think one of the, the problems that we're seeing with a lot of police is, you know, uh, policing has been a family kind of business in, in the United States, especially. I'm not sure if that's true in Canada, but, you know, you would have these, especially on the East Coast, you would have these generations of families that would go into policing. And I think that this is one of those issues where, uh, you know, uh, cops are going to have to be kind of bred to understand this is the brave new world when it comes to technology, and it's going to be used against them, and it's not a one-way street um, anymore. And I think that when that happens, um, uh, uh, you know, I think that we'll see better um, behavior by police. But, you know, one thing that just blows my mind ever since Rodney King is why aren't police more aware that at least there is a possibility that they're going to be um, uh, videotaped and act accordingly. Um, I mean, it just blows my mind some of the things that I see on routinely on TikTok and social media of uh, uh, police officers mistreating individuals because they have to know this is happening and they have to know this is not acceptable. And we're not going to take it anymore, if you will. And I, I, I don't get it. I, but I, I think at the end of the day, it's a generational issue. And I was just teaching – a class yesterday, yesterday to your neighbors, Michigan um, uh, State Patrol, about some of these issues, and they really got it. They were actively going through lesson plans to ensure that their officers were using technology in a way that helps shape culture for the better, not for the worse. And I think that is the first step um, uh, with policing. You've got to teach your old dogs new tricks, and I, and I hope that we're getting to the place um, where that's going to be uh, you know, a snowball effect and roll down the hill quickly. 
we've only got about a minute here, but this actually loops us right back into something you and I had definitely spoken about before, which is also the back end of all of this is effective accountability. It's got to have the ability of a chief to look at an officer and go, you're a problem officer, you're an idiot, and you're fired, and that guy is gone, instead of it just being some part of a, a, a multi-year legal odyssey, or to have that officer just pop up on duty at the next forest over by the, the week after he gets turfed. Yeah, and that happens routinely. It's a uh... It's gotten a little bit better, but there was a report written by, I think, uh, the Vera Institute that something like almost 50 percent of fired officers get back their jobs, especially in union um, uh, cities. But, you know, another problem like Montgomery, Alabama, is they don't even have unions, but they're so desperate for police officers right now, they can't fire anybody. So they just have, you know, a, a pardon my crudeness, but all these turds in the punch bowl, they can't do anything with because they're so desperate for bodies on the force. And I, I think that, you know, we have to, uh, you know, a, a ensure that we have accountability systems put in place, and we have to ensure that incentive systems are put in place. Policing is a hard job. This is, these, are, these are people that should be respected and, and have our love and affection, um, but we need to have excellence in the profession in order to get there. It's very similar to the way that we view the military. We did it through professional development and building a body of professional uh, military folk um, for, the, for the country to honor. And I think we could do the same thing with policing, but we just got to be serious about it. It has to be the tip of the spear of the American uh, conscience. Totally agree with you. And I think everything you're saying applies very much uh, up here as well. Arthur, always a pleasure to talk to you. It had been too long, so I'm glad we we're able to get you on. Uh, you take care of yourself. If we don't talk again in, in uh, the next few weeks, Obviously, a Merry Christmas, a Happy New Year, and we'll, we'll talk again in 2021, and hopefully things will be better that year. Yeah, all right, and Happy Hanukkah as well. Uh, all right. it's, it starts this Friday. So everybody oh, have oh my God, you're right. It's holiday. tomorrow. i, I got to get somebody a card, I just realized. All right, <laughs> thanks well, hey, for this. Hey, what about me, Matt? I'm a, I'm a Jew, so come on. I, I, I expect something in the mail shortly. shortly. All right, well, you know, the, it's, it's in the mail along with the check. <laughs> uh, happy Hanukkah. You take care, man. <laughs> have a good day. Bye-bye.